We'd like in our uh, class this morning to look really carefully at the, the meaning behind the storms, the storms in disciples' life and the storms that Peter has to deal with. We understand, don't we, from Scripture, that the, the sea and the waves roaring represent the nations. And so we take that metaphor and we apply it to the storms we see in the Gospels. And we look carefully, and our session this morning, that's what we're going to do, at those storms to understand something about ourselves and our discipleship as we move towards our desired haven. Isaiah says, doesn't he, Isaiah 57, verse 20, The wicked are like the troubled sea. The Lord Jesus talks about the time of the end when there will be great distress of nations upon the earth. People with perplexity, the sea and the waves will be roaring. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 is a beautiful psalm, and the psalm lays out a key principle for us in understanding the storms in our own lives. Because the psalm shows us that it is God who raises the waves. It is God's wind that raises the waves in our lives. And that's absolutely critical for us to understand. Because if we don't, we find ourselves no different to the nations. As individuals bobbing up and down on the seas with no direction. You see, brothers and sisters, we're different. Because we know that everything that comes into our lives, no matter how challenging it is, is of the Lord. Because the Lord creates the wind that drives the waves. And this lovely psalm, we're going to go in at verse 23, gives us a beautiful snapshot of the life of the disciples of Peter and Andrew, James and John. And it gives us a snapshot of the life of discipleship for us. So we read verse 23 of Psalm 107. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commands and raiseth the stormy wind. We underline it. Right? He commands and raises the stormy winds, which lifts up the waves. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he brings them unto their desired haven. And you know, brethren and sisters, that word desired, the, the, the Hebrew behind there is the idea of pleasure or delight. All right, so... Just circle it, the idea of pleasure or delight in our margins. You see, it begs the question of us, doesn't it? What is your pleasure? What do you personally delight in? What do you crave or desire most in your life? Because that is the haven you will be brought to. And if your mind is on something other than the kingdom of God, then that's the place you'll end up. And so, brethren and sisters, we need to set our affection on things that are above. Our minds as disciples need to be trained to be seeking first the kingdom of God. And if that's where our desire is, then for all of the storms of life, 
For all the times when we feel that we're reeling to and fro, we're staggering like drunken men, we're at our wit's end. Then if we cry to the God of heaven, he will bring us eventually to our desired haven. Now in the Gospels, there are two storms. And there are six occasions that these storms are recorded. You see on the screen there, it's Matthew, Mark and Luke that record the first storm. And it's Matthew, Mark and John who record the second storm. And for us to really appreciate what Peter's going through in Matthew chapter 14, in that second storm, we're going to look in our session this morning at each of these incidents. And we're going to try and pull out a lesson. We could pull out multiple lessons from each of them. We're going to just try and pull out one or two from each of these different records. And so we're going to begin by looking at the first storm. So will you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, then we'll go to Mark 4, then we'll go to Luke chapter 8. So come with me, if you would, to Matthew, to Matthew chapter 8. And we know these storms are the same in Matthew 8, in Mark 4, and in Luke 8, because in these storms, the Lord is on the boat. The Lord is asleep on the boat. And the second storm that's recorded for us, you remember the Lord comes to them, to the disciples who are on the boat. But we're going to look first at the fact that the Lord is on the boat. And so, Matthew chapter 8, we're going to go in at verse 23. And when he, the Lord Jesus, was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea in so much that the ship was covered with waves but the Lord was asleep now that word tempest is the Greek word seismos All right? and it's used on 14 occasions in scripture and on 13 occasions it's translated as earthquake and we're not such surprised, are we, to hear that Greek word seismos being used to describe earthquakes. So I want you to make a note that that tempest that comes has been probably made through an earthquake under the sea. We also want to just quickly note that the boat was covered with waves. Now we know, don't we, that spiritually speaking, the boat represents the ecclesia. The Lord is in the boat with the disciples. But even so, even when the Lord is in the boat, waves can cover the boat. And so, brethren and sisters, we need to understand that our discipleship, life in the vessel, is not always easy. Sometimes our ecclesias can be covered with waves. And what do we do? Well, we pray. We deal with these situations. We talk them through with our fellow disciples. We ask for help from the Lord Jesus Christ. But what we don't do is abandon ship. Sometimes ecclesias are covered with waves. It's a great principle for us to note. And just going back to that, that earthquake, the, a tsunami, of course, is created, isn't it? Through an earthquake in the sea. Earthquakes, seismic waves. There's that Greek word. All right. So we understand that what's taking place here is probably a tsunami, right? It's a massive tempest that comes into the water. And we understand also that in this particular instance, the Lord is asleep. And we note that the disciples wake him up, verse 25. 
They came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. He said to them, Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And so, brethren and sisters, we understand this principle too. That it takes the resurrected Lord to rebuke the winds and the waves. A good note in the margin is Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And we know, don't we, from that psalm, that it's the psalm of the Lord coming in the kingdom where he deals with the nations. Ask of me, and I have given thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And so the Lord is able to deal with the storm, but he does so after he's fallen on sleep. And we understand the principle that's there. We're also just interested to note that the, the word calm there is only used on these three occasions. That Greek word is only used on three occasions. And each of them are relating to this first storm where there is only a calm such as this through the power of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom. That is when the nations will be brought to a calm. So that Greek word is only used of this particular storm. Now come with me to Mark, to Mark's record, to Mark chapter 4. Just want to pick up A couple of other lessons from this first storm that these disciples are in. So Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, we read that on the same day when the even was come, that the Lord Jesus said to them, let us pass over to the other side. And when they had taken away the multitudes, they took him, even as he was, he was, he was tired out, we understand, in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships now this is ecclesial life right we're not as it were all in exactly the same boat within the ontario area there are plenty of little ships right this is a picture to us of ecclesias on the storm and we see once again that the lord is asleep and he's woken after this great storm this this temp this tempest that takes place in the sea and that the, the disciples are so worried and fearful that the Lord wakes and the wind ceased and there was a great, here's our word, calm. Now there's several lovely psalms that pick up on the, the storms here in the Gospels. But I'd like us just to make, it, make a note perhaps of Psalm 46 but, but I'd like you to turn to Psalm 65. Keep a marker, marker in Mark. It's a good tongue twister. And come to Psalm 65. Where we just read of the power of the Almighty in how he is able to still the storms. Verse 5. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are far off upon the sea. Well, this is the disciples, and brethren and sisters, this is you and I. Which by his strength set his fast the, fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God, are able to still the noise of the seas and the noise of the waves. And so we cannot emphasize enough the importance in our discipleship on calling upon the Lord. The God of heaven from the beginning of time, even in the 21st century, 
is able to still the noise of the seas. And in all of our lives, in ecclesial life, in family life, sometimes the waves are roaring and the noise of the seas is tumultuous. The tempest feels like an earthquake. Things happen to us that we can hardly work out. Loved ones fall ill. Children have things wrong with them. Things happen to them. We can hardly get our heads around it. But brethren and sisters, it is the Lord that brings the wind to raise the waves to bring us all to the kingdom. I'll tell you a very quick anecdote. It's regarding... Uh, our brother Ron Abel. So, from what I read, and from what I hear from many of you and others too, our brother Ron was an extraordinary character. In fact, he was the, the dynamite behind really making this whole camp happen. And chatting to our brother Dave Wilson, I said, Brother Dave, it must have been horrendous for Ontario, for all the ecclesias in this area when our brother Ron so quickly and suddenly passed away. And Uncle Dave said to me, Pete, it was. It was terrible. But what it did is it made all the other brethren that were being led by him suddenly have to step up. And so that brother sleeps in the dust of the earth and waits the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think he'd done more than a lifetime's work in the years he was given. And so in all of these circumstances and situations, the Lord knows best. And we just have to trust in the Almighty and know that what he's trying to do, if we have the faith to believe in him, is bring each of us to that desired haven. And so the Lord calls to these disciples in Mark chapter 4, why are you so fearful? How is it that you've got no faith? You don't need to be fearful. Why are you so fearful? Have faith. Now that particular Greek word is of interest to us too. Because it's only used on three occasions. The first was in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. About this storm, when the Lord said, why are you so fearful? The second is here, in this same storm. Why are you so fearful? And the third is in the book of Revelation and chapter 21. Just quickly, turn there with me please. You don't need a marker in Mark, because we're going next to Luke. But come to Revelation chapter 21. Very quickly. Because we need to see who the people are that are at the desired haven. Because Revelation 21 is a kingdom picture. And we see in verse 1, a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and now there is no more sea. Alright? We're past it. We're off the waters. We're at the desired haven. And we read of those that were there, or who will be there. Verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Brethren and sisters, we cannot be fearful. We've got to have faith. We've absolutely got to have faith. And just note that when we come to Luke chapter 8, and I'm sure you'll have noticed it, that in every single one of those accounts, the Lord calls on the disciples to have faith. We've got to. You've got to believe 
in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that it is enough for your sins and to bring you to the kingdom. Don't be fearful. Believe it. And the Lord will make up the rest. Now come to Luke chapter 8. And we just want to pick up here the fact that the, the, the Lord... Uh, is asleep again we read in verse 22 it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with the disciples he said to them let's go over to the other side of the lake and they launched forth and as they sailed he fell asleep and there came down a storm of wind on the lake and they were filled with water and they were in jeopardy the lord has fallen on sleep a good lovely note to have in the margin there is 1 thessalonians 4 14 where we read, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. So the Lord is to sleep, but he rises again. This first storm is on the record to show us the power of the resurrection. We need to see that the Lord falls on sleep before he rises again to deal with the storms. Now, just come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to see the remedy to all disciples perishing. Verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. Now, is Christ risen from the dead? The one that was sleeping on the boat has risen and become the first fruits of all those that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, every man in his own order. Christ the first roots, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Now you'll notice too that in Luke chapter 8, we read, and keep your marker in 1 Corinthians 15, keep your finger there, that they were in jeopardy. They were in jeopardy. That same word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30. Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? You see, we don't need to. You and I aren't in jeopardy. We've been baptised. If we haven't been baptised, and brethren and sisters, in your ecclesias, there will be those who are at an age and have a knowledge of the truth that ought to be baptised. And we should encourage them. And I'm not suggesting that we walk up to them every single week and say, look, there's the bathtub, get in it, right? But I do think that older brothers and sisters shouldn't be worried about going up to that person and put a loving arm around them and saying to them, have you thought about baptism? And the answer will almost certainly come back, yes. And then the next thing will very often be, the problem is, I feel I'm not good enough. And then you say, terrific. You've got it. You can be baptised. If you think you're good enough, you can't be. But if you think you're not good enough, you've got the right frame of mind. Come on. It's time to be baptised. And so I think we should have those discussions because those people stand in jeopardy. And I understand that that's a contentious issue. But brethren and sisters, we know that is the truth. Those people stand in jeopardy every hour. Now, I want you to keep a marker in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I want you to come to Mark chapter 6. And we're going to look now at the second storm. This is the storm where Peter leaves the boat. But it's only in Matthew that we have that particular incident where Peter leaves the boat recorded. But in Mark and in John, we've got the same storm. And so we're going to start by looking in Mark chapter 6. And we're going to go in at verse 44. 
5, where we read that straightway the Lord constrained his disciples to get into the ship to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night he came to them, walking on the sea, and he would have passed them by. Now, we just again want to pick up a couple of points from the Mark record, then John, before we come to Matthew. And we notice this that the Lord is going to walk on the sea. Now in the first storm, the Lord is in the boat and he has to be, as it were, resurrected to deal with the, and calm the storm. Now he's able to walk on the sea. Just, if, you, if you've got a marker, and I hope you have, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just come back to verse 25 where we read following the resurrection that the Lord is going to reign he must reign verse 25 till he has put all enemies under his feet do you see that the Lord is now able to walk on the water he's able to walk on the nations on the enemies of the world the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death for he's put all things under his feet. And so this, brethren and sisters, is why this is the second storm recorded. Now the Lord is able to walk on the water. We're interested to note too, back in Mark chapter 6, that they are toiling in rowing. The idea is they're distressed. It's not simply just hard work, it's distressing as they row and row and row. And we notice that the Lord would have passed by them. Now, that to me seems extraordinary. That the Lord comes out onto the water and he's come out because he can see them toiling but actually, he isn't, in the first instance, going to go to the boat. He's going to pass them by. Now, brethren and sisters, sometimes when we're in the storms, it can feel to us like, is anyone with me? Does the Lord Jesus Christ know what I'm going through? And we may not know it, but the Lord may simply be asking us to hold out a bit longer, to keep toiling in rowing. And he may choose to simply, as it were, pass us by. But we need not worry. He can see us wherever we are in that storm. And he is close by us but he might not come to the vessel. Rather beautifully here, when the disciples, verse 50, verse 49, they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit, they cried out, for they all saw him were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and said, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now, I think there's something lovely there, brethren and sisters, that when we're at our lowest point, and let's be clear, these disciples have been toiling for hours. We'll look at how long shortly. They've been toiling for hours. That when they cry out to the Lord, immediately he's with them. And so ecclesial life is tough. It can be very difficult and very challenging. Sometimes we're in an ecclesia and we think, this is nothing like the ecclesia that I grew up in. The ecclesia I grew up in was so dynamic and exciting and interesting. Or we might be in an ecclesia where we think, the ecclesia down the road, they've got it all going on. It's so exciting. 
We're in a little ship. Hold tight to that little ship. Keep toiling and rowing and helping and working in the Lord. We also notice that Peter picks this idea up. And I want you to make a note in your margin, next to verse 50, the words troubled and afraid. Peter uses in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. Now obviously he's inspired to use them. We're just interested to note it. Those two words the, the Apostle Peter uses in his letter where he talks continuously to the believers about suffering. Twelve times in 1 Peter we come across the word suffer or suffering. Because Peter comes to understand that you have to have suffering before you're going to get to the desired haven, to the glory. And so he writes, but and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And I also want us to note this lovely phrase in verse 51. That when the Lord went into the ship and the wind ceased and they were sore amazed themselves, they were amazed beyond measure. Now that's a really lovely Greek phrase. And it's the phrase used in Ephesians 3 and verse 20. Just perhaps quickly turn here. But if not, certainly make a note of it that that phrase beyond measure is the phrase used in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Let me just read for you this lovely verse. Now to him that is able to do, here's our phrase, exceeding abundantly. That's the phrase, beyond measure. Above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the ecclesia, in the boat. By Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Brethren and sisters, however tough our lives are, the God of heaven, his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, are able to work in our lives beyond measure, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that such a lovely idea that that's what we can call upon when in the boat? Come to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, we have another of these records of this second storm. And we note that when the even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea, verse 17, and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind. Who creates the wind? Psalm 107. It is God that creates the wind to make the waves rise. So do you see that we're explicitly told here in John that it is the Lord who raises the wind to ensure that this storm comes into these disciples' lives. We notice too, don't we, that this detail that only John records, that it was dark. And of course, the Lord is able to see them even through the dark and the storm. We're reminded, aren't we, of Genesis chapter 1, when the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Because these disciples are on the face of the deep and there's darkness. But the Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to move upon the face of the waters as he comes out to these disciples. 
I just want you to make a note uh, in your margins next to verse 18 of, John, of Jonah, rather, chapter 1 and verse 4. Because you'll remember, and we won't turn there because of time, you'll remember that it is the Lord again that brings the wind into the, the, the storm uh, in the life of Jonah. So just note that the great wind that blows here in verse 18, we have that great wind in the life of Jonah that it the Lord who brings. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4 in our margins. Now we also want to note here in John chapter 6 that they row for about 5 and 20 uh, or 30 furlongs. So 25 to 30 furlongs. Well, 5 furlongs is one kilometer. So when we read that they've been toiling, they certainly have. Yesterday, I took Jonah in a kayak, not a kayak, what are they, a canoe, onto the lake. Now naturally, you'd look at me and see a big, strong, strapping guy who wouldn't have a problem on the lake, right? I appreciate that there shouldn't be laughter at that particular point. So I go out onto the lake, Doug, I'm fed up with looking at your face. Uh, you're looking at me with absolute disdain at the idea of me being big and strong, right? So I go out onto the lake, and I say to Joe, yeah, yeah, you'll go out onto the lake. And so he goes on the front. Now, in fairness, although not big and strong, I am overweight. And so as a result, our canoe did this, right? So we head out onto the lake, and just as you get beyond the safe haven, of the little beach here, a tempest blows up. <laughs> a little less laughter, brothers and sisters. It was a tempest. Probably a tsunami. And we get blown, and clearly I'm terrible at this, and I'm unable to get the canoe to face into the wind. Every time I'm trying to push it one way, it's blowing the other way and blowing the other well, we end up on a beach the other way, and I could see Andrew, who was on lifeguard duty, looking over, thinking, oh, great. I'm going to probably have to take over his speaking duties because the speaker's gone, right? <laughs> so I get out the boat and walk through, and w what we sort of don't understand is that there's some lovely sand here on the beach, but beyond about two metres, it's thick, rocky sludge, right? <laughs> and I trudge us back, all the way back to the lake. And my point is that my rowing expedition was approximately 30 metres, right? <laughs> and it felt like I was toiling all night, right? These disciples, do you see? Five or six kilometres? Lake Galilee is only 13 kilometres wide. So if they're in the centre of the lake, they'd get back, do you see? They're going round in circles. They're in dire straits. This can be us sometimes, can't it? We read also that it, the Lord comes to them at the fourth watch of the night. We'll come to that perhaps uh, in a second, just to realise the time that goes past. But we understand that when they're toiling, this is no ordinary toiling. And we need to appreciate this in our lives that it's not as if if we simply call on the Lord he'll be with us that the next second sometimes we need for our characters the characters of our fellow disciples to go through the storms we need to be left out on that lake toiling for five or six kilometers before the Lord may come and so Peter, of course, has to come to understand in his life the need for suffering before the glory. We need, brethren and sisters, to be prepared to toil. And don't be surprised if you have to. Come to Matthew. Come to Matthew chapter 14. The passage that we read together. Matthew chapter 14, we read in verse 22. Apologies, brethren and sisters. I'm looking down thinking, I'm sure it's here, and I'm in Mark. Matthew chapter 14, 
Straightway, verse 22, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. Now, when we read the Matthew record, we might think, well, why does the Lord constrain? Why is he trying to get them in? You may have noticed in John chapter 6, and your note to have in your margin next to the word constrained is John 6, 15. Because what the people did after the feeding of the 5,000 was try to take Jesus and try to make him king. But that's not to be now. Because there needs to be suffering before the glory. And so that's why the Lord constrains them. He gets them into the boat to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary now that word contrary is just uh, of interest it's the, the greek word from which we get our word antagonistic right and often that's what life is towards us isn't it in the storm we, we feel antagonized by the world as we try to challenge deal with the challenges of our lives but but, but in this case, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now, the fourth watch of the night, they used to have four watches. So the fourth is the last. The first watch of the night was between six o'clock in the evening and nine o'clock. The second was between nine and twelve. The third was between twelve and three. And the fourth was between three and six in the morning. Now, notice when the Lord has sent them away. He sent them away, verse 23. He was alone at the evening. So these disciples have been on the water, rowing for five or six kilometers for hours for hours and hours and hours. Brethren and sisters, can you imagine how frightening this would have been? And there were many burly, strong fishermen in that vessel. They were petrified as they rowed in blackness with the storm raging around them. Waves coming up over the wind howling for hour after hour after hour, going round in circles. But it gives us a great, great lesson, doesn't it? The need for patience. We won't turn to James chapter 5, but just keep a marker there. James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. That we need to have patience. That we don't know where the Lord is. The Lord would have passed them by. In our lives, in our storms, the Lord may be 10 metres from our little boat. He may be in the boat for all we know. We've just got to trust and have patience in him. And so we read, don't we, that the Lord says to them, be, verse 27, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. John chapter 16, verse 33, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. The Lord is able to walk on the waters. I've done it. I've slept. I've been risen from the dead. I've been raised from the dead. I can walk on the waters. Be of good cheer, it's me. I've overcome the storm. I've overcome the nations. And then we come to Peter, don't we? Because Peter, in this storm, shows the most extraordinary faith. As they're petrified, as the disciples are crying out, verse 26, for fear. And they see the Lord coming towards them. Brethren, it's just this man has the most incredible faith that he gets out of the boat and he walks 
on the water. Verse 29, the Lord says, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walks on the water to go to Jesus. You see, Peter just loved the Lord. He just wanted to be with him. And even in the most horrendous storm, he's prepared to get out and to walk to him. What does this show us? Well, it shows us a snapshot, a snapshot of what through faith disciples will be able to do. Because through faith, Peter is able to walk on the nations. Do you see? The analogy is the same. Just look at the screen there if you like. Or, or turn to Psalm 47 verse 3. Certainly make a note of it. Psalm 47 verse 3 reads this. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. Do you see? This is the role of the saints. The nations will be subdued under our feet. And so when Peter shows the most extraordinary faith, he gives us a glimpse of what one day you and I will be able to do. We'll be able to walk on water, to walk on the nations. We read in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2 and 3, But to you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise, with healing in his wings, Ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. So do you see, brethren and sisters, that although we often dwell on the fact that Peter begins to sink, in the first instance, in that moment of great, great faith, he shows me and you what disciples can be through faith. Come back, if you aren't, aren't already there, to Matthew chapter 14. Because we see what it is that scares Peter. We read verse 30. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Now, brethren and sisters, we don't need to be afraid ever of the wind. Because the wind is the power of God that raises the storms. Peter didn't look at the waves with great fear. He looked at the boisterous wind with great fear. And brethren and sisters, we learn from this we don't need to be afraid of the wind. That word afraid is the same Greek word. It's, it's, it's the same root. It's the same word, really, that we have in Luke chapter 21 and verse 26, where we read, don't we, of the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. We don't need to have that fear. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is close to the vessel. Our time has pretty much gone. So we're not going to go to 2 Samuel chapter to, uh, 22. Just make a note of it. It's a lovely, lovely uh, psalm really. A psalm of David's. Uh, that picks up the way the Lord will deal with the storm. I'm just going to... Uh, you don't need to go there. I'm just going to quickly refer you to one lovely verse there. Because we see here the principle... That isn't new for Peter and is for us. That when we're in the storm, if we're prepared to cry to the Lord, we read verse 17. He sent from above, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. So what we see the Lord doing to Peter, as Peter stretches forth his hand, that is what the Lord Jesus will do for us all if we're prepared to cry out to him. 
So what are our THMs? What are our take-home messages today? Number one, don't be afraid. We don't need to be fearful. The Lord has overcome the storm through the power of his resurrection. He's risen from the dead. He's able to walk on the waters. He may pass us by, but we have nothing to be fearful of in the storms of this life. Number two, we can trust that the Lord is able to do for us beyond measure exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think so call upon him call upon him in your ecclesial life call upon the name of the lord we need to understand that ecclesial life will be stormy that's the way it is at this particular time we also need to trust that when we feel like we're sinking, that word sink in Matthew chapter 14 is elsewhere translated drown. Don't think for one minute it's that Peter went up, went in the water down to his knees. He was going under. He was going right under the waves. And his hand goes out at the very last moment and the Lord catches him. And so no matter what, no matter how low you may feel at any point in your life, if you get your hand up out of the waters, the Lord will grab it and will pull you to safety and get you back in the vessel. It's Peter who, when preaching, having learned all these lessons in Acts chapter 2, says this it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved you've got a call and finally brethren and sisters and i'd be interested in your thoughts on this perhaps it'll come out in the agora i wonder that the lesson for us is to stay in the boat stay in the ecclesias stay in the little ships until we get to the desired haven. But trust that if we find ourselves in the deep, if we find ourselves in the storm, if we do cry to the Lord, he will pull us out and he will get us back in that boat until we all come together as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ to our desired haven.